Last night in this series of meetings, I would like first of all to express to the eldership of the Brown Trail Church my sincere appreciation for the invitation to return to Brown Trail and to have had the privilege of preaching the gospel of Christ. I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful to these good men who have led our singing at each one of these services. They have done a very wonderful job in their selection as well as in their direction. I'm grateful for those who have made arrangements for us by way of meals and for that great evidence of hospitality. Uh, Paul and Mary Lou, my brother and sister-in-law, are in the audience again tonight. and We've had the privilege of staying in their home and visiting with relatives while the meeting has been in progress. I only have one brother, and that's Paul. We never had another brother, never had another sister. When I was in about the second or third grade, we moved to a little small new house, a little two-bedroom house at 2724 15th Street in Port Arthur, Texas. Had, I'm sure, less than a thousand square feet in it. <clears throat> but my daddy planted a garden in the back, and uh, he planted two plum trees. And I thought that was a wonderful thing to do. We'd have fruit and uh, so on. But I later found out the reason why he planted the plum trees. <clears throat> and um, mine was always beautiful and flourishing, and Paul was always stripped. <clears throat> <laughs> and I'll let you take it from there. But nonetheless, it was, has been a joy to be with Paul and Mary Lou while the meeting has been in progress. I'm so grateful to have been a co-worker with Maxie. Maxie Boren is loved all over the Brotherhood. Friends, I travel the Brotherhood, as you know. I hold meetings and now have for many years. And uh, it, it's been a, a far greater blessing to me than I have ever been to the Brotherhood. I say that without a single reservation. It has given me a wonderful opportunity to observe the church and to know the church, and to know so many people. And I can tell you without reservation that Brother and Sister Boren are greatly loved and respected throughout our brotherhood. If I go to Florida, if I go to the Midwest, or wherever I go out west, I know that to be the case, and I hear those observations. My daddy said that he thought Gus Nichols looked more like an, an apostle than anybody he ever knew. I don't know what his criterion was. But I thought that was a very interesting observation. If I had to characterize Maxie, I say he would be the Apostle John of our day. So Maxie and Fran, we love you all. I know things are not pleasant in life all along the way. I've been there. I understand that. But we pray God's richest blessings upon you all. We do that. We pray for you publicly. We pray for you privately. And I'm going to say something to every single person. Did you notice what I said? I said every single person in this audience. You don't know how fortunate you are. I don't, I'm here to tell you you don't know how fortunate you are. May the Lord bless this good church and may its greatest days, and that is what I believe about it, may your greatest days yet be in the future. To that end, I know we will all work and we'll pray and we'll strive. Life can't be lived on an incline. You'll die of a nervous breakdown. And so life has its peaks, life has its valleys, and we never would appreciate the peaks without the valleys. And so let us remember that the greatest days are yet ahead. I am confident that there is nothing as powerful in building up the church as Christian living. On the other hand, I'm equally confident that there is nothing as detrimental to the cause of Christ as somebody who claims to be a Christian and then does not live up to the standard. Such an one becomes a stumbling block and you can't build great churches out of that kind of material. 
You build great churches out of stepping stones and not stumbling blocks. To each is given a set of tools, a shapeless mass and a book of rules. And all must build, their life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. May I ask all of us that question tonight? If you had to write your own biography, would you be a stepping stone or a stumbling block? How do you tell? Many years ago, <clears throat> I w w went in school, served a wonderful congregation in the rural areas in the state in which I now live. What wonderful Christian people. When I left, I returned back from meeting after meeting after meeting. One of those meetings, I went to see Uncle Ducky. We all called him that affectionately. He was a man way up in years, never had obeyed the gospel, wife a faithful Christian, son an elder in the church, his daughter married a faithful man, and his grandsons became gospel preachers, but he wasn't a Christian. So I went to see him, and I said to him, Uncle Ducky, aren't you going to let me baptize you this time? And his eyes shot fire. And he said, Wendell, you come in here and hold these meetings and leave, come in here and hold these meetings. But he said, I've lived in this community all my life. And he said, I know these folks. And he said, I'll live and die and go to hell. That's an exact quotation. Before I'll ever become a member of them up there. Well, they just killed me. I wasn't accustomed to hearing people talk like that. The meeting ended. He had not obeyed the gospel. I hasten to tell you, though, not very long thereafter, the preacher called me, and he said, I have just finished baptizing Uncle Dockey Skelter, and he lived faithfully until he died. But keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. I was the first full-time preacher in the little town of Rayville, Louisiana, right between Monroe and Vicksburg, Mississippi. And um, the Rayville Church was a very interesting church. Before we knew anything about bus ministries, the church ran four buses. You see, in Louisiana back then, and I suppose now, the parishes, counties did not own the buses. Individuals bought and owned those buses. And as a result of that, they could do with them what they wanted. So they'd run their bus routes, but we had members of the church that owned these buses, and they ran them all over those plantations to bring people into services. One of the men that owned some of those buses was Jesse Cochran. To let you know something about his operation, he and his uh, partner had 476 tenant families on the plantation. And he had these buses, and he was so evangelistically oriented. And he'd run them all over the right of ways, and we'd pick up those people and bring them in. I, this is literal. I stayed in the baptistry. I cannot tell you how many people I baptized. We had baptized so many that I said to the brethren, we need to stop preaching on Wednesday night and start having Bible school so we can indoctrinate these babes. We'd have Wednesday night services and couldn't seat the people, literally could not seat them. And they all discussed and they said, no. I said, I'll tell you what let's do. I said, let's just keep having preaching on Wednesday night, but let's have Bible study on Thursday night. Only church I ever preached for where we had two midweek services. Well, one day I was standing out of the media house um, lawn, and one of our elderly members, Brother Welcher, said, Brother Winkler, would you like to know why I'm a Christian? I said, yes, sir, Brother Welcher, I'd really like to know that. He said, you see that man standing on the steps? Jesse Cochran. I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm a Christian because of Jesse Cochran. Do you know who those folks were back there of whom Uncle Dockey said, I'll live and die and go to hell before I'll become a member of them? You know who they were? They were stumbling blocks. Do you know who Jesse Cochran was? He was a stepping stone. To each is given a set of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And all must build, ere life is flown, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. 
You see, it is not what we eat, but what we digest that makes us strong. It is not what we make, but what we save that makes us wealthy. It is not what we read, but what we remember that makes us wise. And it is not what we say, but what we live that makes us Christians. Our lesson tonight, what do you mean by Christian living? In answer to that question, we could observe that Christian life is a life of prayer, a life of Bible study, a life of soul winning, and on and on we could go. And I believe that would be very profitable. But whenever the Bible answers a question in a very succinct way, we can never do better than go right there and make our study. There is a theme that pervades one entire New Testament epistle that answers that question. What do you mean by Christian living? And so tonight, for the appropriate time allotted, we will dedicate our time to a perusal of that book to find out God's answer to what do you mean by Christian living. It's only composed of four chapters. And there's a single emphasis in each one of those chapters. And if I can ascertain what the emphasis is in each one of those chapters, when I will have perused the whole book, I will have that in a very capsule form, the Lord's answer to what is meant by Christian living. So that being the case, let us begin. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 has 30 verses, and there are no less than 16 direct references to Christ in that chapter which means that Paul, on an average of uh, more frequently than, once every other verse, directs our attention to Jesus. Directs our attention to Jesus. So that we can accurately say that the theme thrust of Philippians 1 is that the Christian life is the Savior-centered life. It's impossible for a man to live his life in a moral vacuum, state of nothingness. There has to be something around which his life gravitates. Now, with some people, that may be a recreational pursuit. With others, it may be an occupation. And with others, it may be a hobby. But for the child of God, the center around which his life gravitates is the Lord Jesus Christ. When I lived in Bossier City, Louisiana, in those days, I used to play golf occasionally. And the brethren said, Brother Wink, let's go out and play a game of golf. So I would go out. I had heard that one of our deacons was absolutely a master at the game. So I said to him, I said, Bob, some of us are going out to play. Why don't you go with us? No. He said, I don't think I will, but thank you. Well, some time passed by, and we decided to go out and play again. And I said, hey, Bob, we're all going out to play golf. I said, why don't you come go with us tomorrow? Night? No. He said, I appreciate that, Wendell. He said, I don't believe I will. Well, about the third time, he felt a little guilt-ridden. And he said, Brother Winkler, he said, um, I guess I need to explain why I never go golfing. He said, a number of years ago, I played golf. And he said, I didn't play golf once a week. He said, I played golf every day. He said, I love that game so much that it could be raining in torrents. And I'd go out to the golf course and sit there in the clubhouse waiting to see if it would slack enough to where I could play at least two holes. He said, that's how much I love that game. He said, I think I've ever started playing it again, that I could not control it. So I just never court the temptation. I don't go anymore. You know what he was telling me? At one time in my past, I had a center around which my life gravitated. You know what it was? A recreational pursuit. With some, as I said, it may be a hobby. With others, it may be a, an occupation. But again, I repeat for all of us, our lives must center around the Savior. Now, suppose I were to ask this my fine audience tonight, how many of us believe that our lives ought to uh, be lived in a Christian family? Oh, yes. Suppose I were to say, well... So do you think our lives ought to center in Christ? Oh, yes, sir. Then suppose I were to say, well, we're all on common ground. We all understand. And now let's go to the next observation. You would have been dealt an injustice. Why? 
those of us who preach sometime deal with things that sound good and are good, but they're abstractions to people. We need to get them out of the clouds and reduce them down to where we live. And so tonight, for a brief moment, I want to take that Savior-centered life and get it out of the realm of abstraction and reduce it down to where we live seven days a week and see what a difference that kind of life will make. Number one, if my life centers in Christ, it means that I will seek to know the will of Christ in every decision I make. That's obvious, isn't it? That if my life centers in the Lord and I've got some decisions to make, I'm going to seek to know His will. Let's suppose your employer calls you in tomorrow and he says, John, this is going to sound very strange to you, but I really mean, I mean this sincerely. I want to speak to you for about five, maybe ten minutes, during which time I ask you do not interrupt. I don't want you to blink. I don't want you to enter at all, shake your head affirmatively. I don't want you to shake your head negatively. I don't want to see any frown or I don't want to see any smile on your face. Placidly, you please sit and listen. And boy, you're a, you want what's happening? And then he says, John, we are going to open up a plant in Rutland, Vermont, and you know more about the product that we're going to manufacture there than anybody in our entire company. And we want to transfer you to Rutland, Vermont. Now, John, I know you were reared here. I know this has been your home for many, many years. I know your aged parents are here. I know you have teenage children, but we're going to make it worth your while. You see, if you will agree to go to Rutland, Vermont, you're going to start off with an annual salary of $150,000 with a guaranteed increase of 10% every year on the former year's salary. Add to that. We're going to fly you and your entire family back home, all expenses paid, for you just decided a week to 10 days at a time. We'll do that every three months so you can keep in contact with your family. But if you agree to go, you're going to have to stay five years. Now the question, are you going? Brother Winkler, am I going? Do you know what my income is now? And you said 150000 yeah, that's what I said. And a 10% increase every year on the pre... That's what, you ever thought about what I'd be making in five years? Am I going? And I don't see my relatives now much more frequently than what you've just outlined. Yeah. Let's change the scenario. Jim is brought in. Same presentation. Jim goes home. And he says to his wife, and he gives to her the presentation. And they say, five years? Wonder if there's, if there's a church of Christ in Rutland. You know, five years. Mary, she's 16. Five years. She'd be 21. Probably selecting her marital companion during that five-year period. Wonder if it's a church of Christ. Maybe this is our answer to God helping us to be an instrument in soul winning. We might become vocational missionaries. We could ask the church back home to come up, conduct a campaign, and we could either expand the church or we could establish the church. Wonder if they have any Christian camps up there. We can give our children exposure there. And maybe we could ask the home church to give us a working fund and we could put articles in the newspaper and teach, and give us as a contact, and maybe we can reach them. So do you see any difference at all between the first scenario and the second? Do you see any difference? What's the difference? You see, the first family is making the decision basically on the basis of the monetary, mercenary. But the other one is doing what? Searching, trying.
trying to find out what would be the will of God for the use of our lives and what would be the will of God for our family. Now, what's my point? If my life centers in Christ, I'm going to come to seek to know the will of Christ in every decision I make. You see, I will have imbibed of the Spirit of Christ even when the, the cross had already cast its dark shadow over his path and he was found to the garden praying, not my will, but thine be done. And I'm going to tell you something. That is not easy to pray and really mean it. Years ago, C.D. Plum wrote an article on the Gospel Advocate in which he took the lyrics of Take My Life and Let It Be, and he based his lesson, and it was fabulous. He said, take my money and make it thine. He didn't discuss that. And he said, take my time and let it be, and he discussed that. And when he got down there and said, and take my will, and make it thine. He said what I've just said. That's the hardest part of the song to sing. And I think that's correct. But we need to work at that being the case. Secondly, if my life centers in Christ, it means that Christ and the Church of Christ will be first in my every list of priorities Again, isn't that obvious? If my life is centering in the Lord, surely that must so be. Let's suppose that a man makes, and you set the figure, $1,000 a week, $5,000, whatever, $10 a week. And whenever that money comes into his possession, how is he going to make distribution of it? Is he going to say so much for the house payment, so much for the utility bill, so much for the pharmacy, so much for, uh, you know, the insurance premium? And oh, yes, 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 I do want to give some to the Lord, to the church and to the Lord. Is that how he handles that? Oh, indeed not. Do you know what the basic difference is between a faithful and an unfaithful steward? Here it is. The basic difference is that the faithful steward always adjusts his living to his giving, whereas the unfaithful steward always adjusts his giving to his living. So when I say, so much for the house payment, so much for the utility bill, so much for the insurance premium, oh yes, I'm going to give. What's happened? My giving has been adjusted to my living. But if I'm a faithful steward, I take my income and a certain liberal percentage of that is set aside for God. And then it's so much for the house payment, so much for the utility bill and all. Now what is indeed the basic difference between these two men? Who's first? What does it mean if my life centers in Christ? It means I repeat, Christ and the church of Christ is first in my every list of priorities. Well, Years ago, I was dealing with some of these principles in a ladies' Bible class. An elderly lady, incidentally, the greatest untapped, untapped resource in the church of our Lord tonight are the retirees. Every church of Christ ought to have a viable, workable, alive program of activity involved in benevolence, involved in soul winning with all the retirees. Every church ought to have that. Anyway, here was a retiree, an elderly lady. And she said, uh, Brother Winkler, may I ask a question? I said, sure. She said, you know, I've always tried to practice that. But I've often wondered, if we're going to give 10% of our monies to God, why don't we give 10% of our time? And I got to thinking about that. You see, there are 168 hours in a week. Round figures at 10%, that's 17 hours. That's 10% of our time. Now, let's see. If a man came to Sunday morning Bible school, Sunday morning worship, Sunday night worship, Wednesday night prayer meeting, and to a men's business meeting or she to a ladies' Bible class, that's five hours. If that same person, read their Bible and prayed one hour every day, and few do, that's seven more hours. Now add that seven to the previous five, and you've got 12 hours. How would you describe that man? 
What's he doing? You never open the meeting house doors, he's not here. That man reads his Bible and prays an hour a day. Why, he says he's one of our most faithful people. Twelve hours. Now let's be arbitrary. Let's say that same man works and you give the location and he gets off work four o'clock in the afternoon. He gets back around in the community about 4.30 and uh, on Monday he visits the local hospital for an hour. He's home between 5.30 and 6. Still home at night with his family. On Tuesday he decides to visit the local home for the aged for about an hour, still home 5.30, so home at night with his family. On Wednesday, he's come by this meeting house. He's got the name of two of the visitor, visiting families from last Sunday, and he goes and sees them for about 10 minutes apiece, urges them to place their membership, etc. Still home about 5.30, so. And then on Thursday, well, he always reserves Thursday night to teach a home Bible study. On Friday, he goes by to see somebody don't come to church anymore, reads the Bible with him and prays, still home by 5.30, still home at night with his family. And did you know, when he gets through doing that and reading his Bible every day, one hour, and praying, and attending every one of the services, he has spent 17 hours. That's 10%. And he still has 90% of his time to use as he desires. Brethren, we can, we just don't. A man like that's a student. A man like that lives near God. A man like that's faithful. And nobody is in the hospital, shut in, visited to the service, prospect, unless he's had a part in their life. You see, one of our greatest problems is time management. Now, we'll not get into that. That's a very interesting biblical study as to how that is all to be done. And you still have personal development time, and you never neglect your family. Did you notice, incidentally, that every one of those scenarios had everybody at home at night? See, I don't believe in church work disintegrating families. I don't believe in that. If I was an elder, I'd work very hard to see that never happened. Sometime brethren both say, you know, we're up at the church house every single night in the week. That is absolutely, friends, a wrong approach to church work. We got to understand that the family has to be kept as a cohesive unit to build great, great churches. But anyway, are we beginning to see what it means if our life centers in Christ? We've only made two observations there, and that is I'll seek to know the will of Christ in every decision that I reach. I'm going to put Christ and the church of Christ at the very top of every list of my priorities. Uh, so much more there, but I will leave that. Secondly, you come over to chapter 2 of uh, Philippians. And there is a singular thrust. It's so easy to see. Philippians 2 is like one of the Florida Satsuma oranges. When you peel it, it the sections just fall apart. If you read Philippians 2, that's what that chapter does. It just falls apart. There are only three sections. The first section is verses 1 through 5. The second section is also 5 through verse 12. And the third section is 14 through the close of the chapter. Well, let's go to the first section. Let's excerpt. In that area, you're going to find these statements. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man upon his own things, but every man upon the things of others. Now, what is Paul teaching? He is telling me, that the Christian life is a self-emptying life. Now, go to the second paragraph, and I'm going to amalgamate the King James and the American Standard Translation. And in that text, the text thus will say, Who Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery 
to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, now watch it, and emptied himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What's in paragraph 2? The Lord's exemplification example. The exemplification of the self-emptying life. You see, the Lord never gave us a requirement unless He gave us the example, except for one thing. He requires me to repent, and He never repented. But everything else in principle, He gave us the exemplification. Now let's go over here to the third paragraph. In the third paragraph, you find the content centering around two New Testament saints, Timotheus and Epaphroditus. I only have the time to deal with one, so I'll simply lift Epaphroditus. What does Paul say about Epaphroditus? He said he was sick nigh unto death. But he said he had a heavy heart. Wonder why? Because, he said, he, Epaphroditus, had heard that you had heard he was sick. That's strange. That a man would have a heavy heart because somebody heard that he was sick. Why was that the case? Because the Epaphroditus no doubt reason. If my brethren in Philippi, if they hear about me being sick, I am going to become the burden of their hearts. And I don't want to be the burden to anybody. That is beautiful living. To so live that I am not the burden to anybody. Friends, next year, year after, I will be preaching for 60 years. I, I baptized the first person I ever baptized when I was 13 in the mission fields of Louisiana. My mom and daddy sent me to the mission fields. Can you imagine that? When I was 13 years old, to work with a missionary. And all during those years, I have observed many things of beauty, of beauty. And I've seen some things that have been very disconcerting. During those years, I have worked very, very closely with elderships. I have been in elders' meetings when the elders were so burdened till I have seen them get out of their chairs and every single one of them get on their knees. I've seen this. And three differing times in a meeting, pray to God for the very same thing. Saying, Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. We don't know what to say. Lord, won't you help us reach the soul? We love this man, and we're trying to reach him. Our efforts seem to be so futile. Won't you guide us? What's my point? Here is this man, responsible for valuable time, being taken away from these men's families. He has become the object of their care. He's become the object of their burden. And he could care less. I want to tell you something, friend. If you don't care how other people are burdened over you, you've got a serious spiritual problem. You see, we don't try to make ourselves a burden to other people. We've so emptied ourselves of self till we try to escape that approach to life. I've had this to happen a few times, certainly not many. I've never indicted the wonderful, wonderful people in the church, indeed, by giving a wholesale indictment. That's not right. But nonetheless, I have had a few times people walk out and they say, you don't care whether a man's dead or alive up here, do you? I'd say, I'm sorry. I just don't know that to which you make reference. Well, they said I've been in a hospital a week and nobody came to see me. Nobody asked about me. I didn't get a call, didn't get a single card. I checked the bulletin. My name was not there. In, and I asked and you never even announced about it. You don't care whether a man's dead or alive up here, do you? I said, what? You mean you have been of a hospital? Yes. I am so, so sorry. We did not know that. We would have been there. Can we help you? Just a moment. That person's present today. And the announcements have been made. Brother A is in the hospital. Sister C is in the hospital. Wonder if they can 
complainant is going to send a card. Wonder if they're going to make a call. Wonder if they're going to make a visit. What's my point? Some of us live life on this basis. When I'm in trouble, make sure you help me. But when other people are in trouble, I'm not too good at helping in those areas. You see, what we do, we live life, you know, on a self-serving basis. It's like the little students, you know, in the, in the small class. And the teacher had taught the great story about the Good Samaritan. And then she said, what do we learn from that? And one little fellow answered, that teaches me that any time I'm in trouble, somebody, somebody ought to help me. Well, see, you missed the whole thrust of the story. Rather than when other people are in trouble, we need to help them. What what causes all of that? We've never learned to empty self or self. All preachers, elders, do marital counseling. When I first started doing that as a young preacher, I got all worked up. Somebody called and said, Brother Winkler, can we come and talk to you? And I'd say, oh, wonder what their trouble is. What can I say? Boy, I'd get all worked up. And I'd get in there and I'd listen. Well, repeat it, over repeat of those type of things. And before long, I woke up. And I can tell you, it's going to sound very peculiar to you, but I can tell you without reservation. I can tell you what they're going to say before they ever come in for the counseling. I can write the script. I know what they're going to say. And I'm not an expert and anything. Well, what do you mean, Brother Winkler? Ordinarily, she does the calling. And she'll ask if they can come, and you say, sure. And if you decide to counsel them together, they'll come in. And you'll broach the matter after a little bit, and you'll say, Mary, would you like to begin? You made a call, said you were having some difficulties. And she'll say, here's her prefatory statement. Brother Winkler, it's embarrassing to be here. I understand. But you know what he said to me, me, the other day? You know what he did to me, me, the other day? You know what I, I think? John, do you have anything to add to this conversation? Brother Winkler, you know what she does? It just tears me, me. Brother Winkler, you know what would really make me, me? You know what I think, I, what's wrong with the marriage? They are me deep in self. You can go to every medical doctor you can find. You can consult every marriage counselor you can locate. You can buy every book you can find on marital bliss. And you'll never have it until you learn one lesson. What is it? Live for your companion. There is no shortcut to marital bliss. None. Why can I be so blatant with that? God created the marriage relationship. And God said happy marriage is built on love. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love seeks not her own. If you could ever find marital bliss and have it built on selfishness, God would be inconsistent with his teaching. You can forget it. It's not yours to find. You can't have it. And so, you see, all unhappy marriages are based on what? Nobody learned Philippians 2. Empty yourself for self. When I was in junior high school, I, they, it was a large high school, and they segregated by gender in various classes. I was in an all-boys class. The teacher popped in the first day of the class, and he said, now, boys, he said, I want to tell you, first day of class, he said, everybody can make an A in this course. Well, I thought he was bouncing it off of the wall, but he said, everybody can make He said, I'll tell you what, he said, here. And he distributed, distributed sheets of paper. He said, if you ever get behind in your grade, he said, don't worry about it, a particle. He said, I mean this. I don't worry about your grade. He said, if you get behind 25 points, he said, pick up that sheet of paper. And you'll find a project on there worth 25 points. He said, do the project. Bring it to me. I'll give you 25 points and your grade's right back up to a level of 100. He said, don't worry about your grade, a single particle. That was a one more great semester. Never had a discipline problem. I'm going to give you one of those projects. He said, I'll give you 25 points. If you will carry 
in your shirt pocket a little spiral notebook for one day. Now that's a large public high school supported by tax dollars. And that's what that man's teaching. He said, yes, I'll give you 25 points. Just carry, carry that little spiral notebook in your pocket for one day. He said, I don't want you to do anything with it. But one thing. He said, the day you carry it, all I want you to do with it is every time you use the words, me, mine, my, or I, said, just pick it out and put a mark in it. Said, just pick it out and put a mark in it. Said, just pick it out and put a mark in it. Said, just pick it out and put a mark in it. Said, just pick it out and put a mark in it. I challenge you to do that. It will boggle your mind. Why? That's our problem. When a church has difficulty, listen to me, that text has been violated. Don't make a difference where it is. That text has been violated. It's that elementary. You better get some notebooks and put them in your pocket. Chapter 3. In chapter 3, there is a singular emphasis. It's so easy to see. Only has two sections. Verses 1 through 12, 13 through the close. In that first section, Paul discusses the era of Judaism. Therein he says this, We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, have no confidence in the flesh. You see, the Judaizers had confidence in the flesh. So Paul is refuting Judaism. Then you come to that last paragraph, and he refutes another era that has a big, long name with a very small meaning. The big, long name is antinomianism. Anti means against. Nomianism is from the Greek word nomos. It means law. So an antinomianist was a man who was against law. Now here was his philosophy. There is no law. That is, there is no code of conduct. There is no standard of behavior by which I am to be governed. So that being the case, what did he do? Why well, he threw off all moral restraint and he groveled in his own iniquity. Add to that, since there was no code of conduct, there is no standard by, of measurement. So to him, he gave no attention to retrogression or to progression. Whatever was involved in salvation to him was a present possession. So Paul says, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget the things that are behind, and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's he doing? He's refuting antinomianism. Now when you see that Philippians 3 refutes two errors, what's the theme of the chapter? Chapter 3 tells me that the Christian life is the sound life. Today the era may be neo-Pentecostalism. It may be premillennialism. It may be Calvinism. It may be subjectivism. It may be hedonism. It may be modernism. It may be liberalism. And on and on we could go. But whatever the era is, we take a stand, a stand against that, and do our very best to refute it. You see, Ephesians 5, 11 says, have no, man, that's exclusive, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's a two-pronged passage. First part of the text says what? Don't have any participation at all with error. Second prong, but you lay the error bare. That's what the word reprove means, lay it bare and expose it. But you lay it bare. So what's the emphasis? It's not enough for me to refrain from teaching premillennialism. I've got to expose it. Not enough for me to refrain from teaching Calvinism. I've got to expose it. Not enough for me to refrain from dancing. I've also got to expose it. So many times we meet the first requirement of that text and never do anything with the same. And I'm going to ask all you teachers of these young people, and these teenagers. When's the last time you did any exposure of these worldly practices in the church today? We oftentimes leave that exclusively to the pulpit. That is an injustice to the man who stands here. Should he expose it? Sure. But that's why sometimes he's the object of merciless criticism. And that's all because he's the exclusive voice. When elders ought to be preaching when he's away in a meeting. And elders ought to take some of these controversial subjects and discuss it lovingly as a shepherd. And all these Bible school teachers ought to be joining together hand in hand 
and as a cooperative unit, ought to be teaching these matters. And that might make for a strong church. And if I were rearing my children again, I'd say, Lord, lead me to that church. You see, that's Philippians chapter 3. And now, last of all today, oh, I love that last chapter of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4 says that the Christian life is the serene life. wonder why that's the case. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Verse, verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Verse 11, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be there with content. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Down about verse 19, my God shall supply all of your need. Now let's put that together. Verse 4 says the Christian life is a happy life. Verse 6 says it's a worry-free life. Verse 11 says it's a contented life. Verse 13 says it's a victorious life. And verses 18 and 19 says it's an all-sufficient life. And when you put together happiness, worry-free, contentment, victory, and all-sufficiency, that spells serenity. That's Philippians 4. Now, in reversal order, I'll have serenity to the extent that I'm sound, self-emptying, and Savior-centered. What do you mean by Christian living? That's Paul's inspired answer. It may be in this good audience today that there is those saying, Brother Winter, I don't live like that. And it's most apparent. And my brethren who know of my delinquency have a right to know of my repentance. And I'm responding tonight to be restored. It may be you here and you never have been baptized into Christ upon your penitent faith. And that's your primary need. And if that be the case, friends, how we long to see you come. You see, we want to embrace you as a brother in the Lord, as a sister in Christ. We all want to mutually be able to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, so if you hear and have needs that could be supplied by a response to heaven's call and the Savior's will, we're going to sing the song that has been announced tonight. And as we sing this great song, we pray if you hear a need to come, that you will. Even now, as together, we now stand and we sing.